So finishing up talking about evolution, where we were uh, in our last lecture, which again, unfortunately did not get recorded, was I talked a bit about desert pupfish in the genus Saprinodon. Uh, they look like this. And if you recall, I mentioned that in different little pockets of wetlands, little springs and spring-fed streams out in the middle of the Mojave and Great Basin deserts of the Western United States, you could find these little species of fish each species is restricted to one little area of, of wetlands, one spring or one pond, one bit of moisture. And they're separated from each other by, in some cases, over 100 miles of very dry desert. Um, desert that fish are just not able to cross. And I reviewed the evidence that there had once been a lot more lakes and rivers in what's now the desert, uh, because we can still find dry riverbeds and dry lake beds and things like that. And talked about how the likeliest way that those fish got there is that there used to be one species of pupfish that was spread all through those rivers and lakes. And as the rivers dried up, isolated populations of pupfish were separated from each other, no longer able to swim from one place to the other. And each isolated population adapted to new conditions, some for very fresh water, some for very salty water, some for hot water, some for cold, and so on. And what we've ended up with after roughly 10,000 years of natural selection is separate species of pupfish uh, that actually cannot interbreed anymore. Uh, people have tried that experiment and it turns out that they can't interbreed. We call them new species. And 10,000 years sounds like a long time, uh, but there were Native Americans in the area. There were fully modern uh, humans that were around. We've actually found native made fish ponds on the shores of these ancient lakes that now don't have any water in them. Uh, but we know they must have had water um, not that long ago, sometimes just a few thousand years ago. So we can put all this together and make a case that modern pupfish species descend from a common ancestor and that ancestral pupfish species got split and each of the separate populations ultimately became a new species. So the idea is that we can infer that new species do form. Uh, we can see stages in the process of how it happened. And we can use that to reconstruct the relationships through common ancestry of desert pupfish. And we can represent that pattern by branching diagrams. This one's called a cladogram. Uh, kledos is ancient Greek for a branch. And what is this here? All of these names right here are Latin names of pupfish species. Uh, the C stands for Cyprinodon. And what we've done is compared all of these species, looked at features that they've got in common. This particular tree the features that we've looked at are features of the DNA, and I'll talk later as to how we do that. Um, leave that for right now. Um, and don't worry about these little numbers that are here on the branches. That refers to some statistics that we do um, that don't concern us here. All I want you to see is that this is a diagram with branches, and any two species that branch from the same point are hypothesized to have descended from a common ancestor. So all of these things here that say Saprinodon nevidensis, that's one species of pupfish, that shares a common ancestor, which happens to be represented by this point right here with the devil's hole pupfish. 
And both of those share a more distant common ancestor with the Salt Creek pupfish, represented by that point right there. And all of those share a distant common ancestor with the species we didn't talk about called Suprinidon fontanalis back here. And then Suprinidon macularius, two subspecies share a common ancestor. And those two share a common ancestor with the third one, Suprinidon radiosus, and so on. And we can keep going back and back and back. And again, it's not too terribly unlike tracing your own family history. Um, you know, the way, you know, I share a common ancestor with my sister. And she and I share a more distant common ancestor with all of our cousins. And she, I, and all of our cousins share an even more distant common ancestor with all of our second cousins, and so on. You can keep going, going back in human families. You can do the same thing for living species. And we can use various lines of evidence, some of which I will talk about much later, to keep pushing these cladograms even farther back. All those pupfish are in the family Suprinodontidae. And we think, based on looking at their DNA, that they share a common ancestor back here with all of the species in another family, the family Fundulidae, uh, the killifish. And that Suprinodontids and Fundulids share a more distant common ancestor with the family Posiliidae. Uh, which includes guppies and platys and sword tails, uh, fish that you might know because they're popular in home aquariums, uh, fish that you could see in any well-stocked pet store. And those share a common ancestor way back here with fish in the family Aplochylidae, which I think are called half beaks. And all of those share common ancestors with other fish. All of these names um, are, which you may not be able to read, and it's okay, you don't really have to. Uh, all of those names are just names of fish families. And you can see they're connected in this branching pattern. Uh, so our pupfish are right here. And they go back to a common ancestor and they share a common ancestor with this larger group. And that larger group shares a common ancestor with an even larger group. And all those fish share a common ancestor with all other fish and so on. Uh, so what you're looking at here is a branching diagram showing the way that we think um, major orders of bony fish are related to each other and they're related through each other through shared common ancestry. And we can keep going back even farther and we've made a stab at reconstructing the common ancestry of all living and extinct organisms. Any two living things share a common ancestor if you go back far enough. As far as anyone can now tell, life on Earth only appeared once. I'm not going to go into how we think that happened, not because you couldn't understand it, because you're all really smart people, uh, but it would take more time than we've got to go through all of the chemistry background that you'd need. So I'm going to kind of stop there and wave my arms. Uh, but the last common ancestor of all life would have been some little blob down around here. And that has given rise to bacteria, which are all of the branches up here. And archaea, which are all of the branches over here. And ultimately eukaryotes, which are all of the branches down there. And we're constantly refining our estimate of what the shape of this tree is, uh, looking at new sources of data, 
testing our hypotheses and very often modifying our hypotheses as we find new sources of data. I'll try to give you a little taste of how this is done, uh, but this is a much bigger field than I can cram into one lecture. Um, So we draw those trees. What gives us the right to draw them is we look for shared characters. Two living things, two species, two organisms that share a recent common ancestor are more likely to have features in common than two more distantly related organisms are. Uh, so if we look here at, we've got fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, rodents and primates. Primates is the group of mammals that includes lemurs, monkeys, and apes. Well, first we can see that all of those groups have some features in common. They're all eukaryotes, for example, and they've all got backbones. Uh, they've all got a nerve cord running down the backside of the organism that's protected by a chain of bones, uh, the vertebrae. There's multiple explanations for how that could have happened, but the simplest is that all six of these groups have backbones because they inherited them from a common ancestor that also had backbones, a common ancestor that did not necessarily look like any of them. Uh, we've got some fossils that give us the beginning of an idea of what that common ancestor looked like. Uh, if you really want to know the details, you can take biology 4480 sometime. But we put fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, rodents, and primates into one large group. It's called the vertebrata because they all share backbones. And we think that they do because they all have inherited those backbones from a distant common ancestor. Now within that group, Amphibians, reptiles, birds, rodents, and primates have a feature that the fish don't. They've got limbs, right? Arms and legs. The simplest explanation for how that happened is that they're descended from a common ancestor that wasn't an ancestor of fish that had four limbs. And we've got some, in this case, some pretty good fossil evidence as to what that ancestor looked like um, again, I wish I had time to talk more about that. But we can put amphibians, reptiles, birds, rodents, and primates in a group. It's technically called the tetrapods of the four-limbed organisms. And within that group, reptiles, birds, rodents, and primates all share embryos that develop within a set of membranes called the amniotic membranes. Uh, in humans, the amniotic membranes make up uh, the so-called bag of waters uh, surrounding a fetus. You know, you've heard of this, when a woman is about to give birth, her water breaks, that bag of fluids surrounding her embryo uh, breaks open. That's what we're talking about here. That feature is shared by primates, rodents, reptiles and birds. Uh, you could see those membranes if you've ever seen a chicken egg hatching, for example. And so we think those four all descend from a common ancestor down here. And then finally, rodents and primates share features that nobody else does. Uh, they've got hair. Uh, there's some other things like they've got red blood cells without nuclei and a diaphragm breathing muscle and uh, they produce milk for their babies. And so we put them in a group called the mammals. And we think that all mammals have those features because they're descended from a single common ancestor. Not an ancestor, not exactly like anything that's around today. That common ancestor would not have been identifiable as any mammal that we know running around now but nonetheless, it would have had hair and given milk and been warm-blooded and all of these things. And 
its descendants would have inherited those traits and those descendants would ultimately include rodents, primates, um, and a lot of other things that aren't even shown on this diagram, like dogs and cats and elephants and um, water chevrotain deer and pronghorn and rock hyraxes and all of that, all, all of the mammals. So that's how we draw up a cladogram. We look for patterns in characters, in traits that organisms share. And we use the, those to draw up hypotheses of shared common ancestry. Now, people often get the impression based on diagrams like this, that what evolution creates is this march of progress. Uh, that over here on the left, we've got some sort of blobby protist thing in the ocean that somehow becomes a fish that somehow becomes a creeping kind of fish that becomes some kind of amphibian that turns into a mammal, that turns into an ape, into a caveman, into, uh, into modern people, that it all happens in some kind of line. Uh, almost as if evolution was uh, the Apple Corporation and it just periodically released new models of iPhone right? First came the iPhone, and then that got replaced by the iPhone 2, and that got replaced by the iPhone 3, and now we're up to, I don't know, iPhone 11 or whatever it is. I don't know. I use Android. And people have the impression that evolution creates these things one after the other with every link in this series from the goo to you more advanced than its predecessors, just like the iPhone 7 is supposed to be better than the iPhone 6. This is not the way evolution works. This is a cartoon. It might be humorous. It's not really the way that it happens. Evolution makes trees. These just happens to be some trees based on some fossils of some of the earliest vertebrates to walk on land uh, that had limbs. Uh, you can see some outline drawings of what they would have looked like. And uh, you can also see some diagrams of what their skulls looked like. You don't need to worry about those details. What you need to see is that this is, again, a branching pattern as species are split and populations become new species, what we get is a branching pattern of species through time. And what we try to do is reconstruct the entire pattern. We can't take organisms and just line them up in nice, neat, single file lines. We try to use the evidence that we've got to reconstruct the totality of the branching process. And I've had people in, in Arkansas, when I tell people that, you know, I'm an evolutionary biologist, I don't always get a really warm response for some reason. And I've had, tell pe I've had people tell me that evolution must be false because a cat, can never, a cat can never turn into a dog. You know, if you breed a bunch of cats, you just get more cats and a cat is never going to give birth to a bloodhound. Okay, that's absolutely true, but nobody has ever made the claim that it was true. Cats did not evolve from dogs. Dogs did not evolve from cats. You heard it here first. They're related through common ancestry. They're both descended from an extinct mammal living approximately 40, 45 million years ago that would have looked like that uh, we don't really know what color it was, but we do have pretty complete skeletons. Uh, it was called a miacid. And if you'd seen one, you might have said, hey, it looks like a little weasel living in a tree. But that has features that have been inherited by all of its descendants, including cats, dogs, and also raccoons, bears, ferrets, wolves and coyotes and lions and tigers and quite a lot of other mammals. 
something like that organism shown in the drawing at the bottom was the common ancestor of all of the mammals we put in the order carnivora, which includes dogs, cats, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what I mean by branching patterns of common ancestry. Cats don't turn into dogs. Dogs don't turn into cats. Both of them come from a distant ancestor that is not like anything that's around today. It's not still alive. Uh, it's a member of a group that we call the Myacidae. We'd, we'd just call it a Myacid today. The same, by the way, applies to human evolution. This is the kind of thing that people always get really interested in because here I am talking about uh, our own species. Here's the thing, there's no serious doubt that our own species has changed over time. And that if you go back uh, a couple million years, you don't find modern people with big brains, that our ancestors had smaller brains and bigger brows. Um, and our closest living relatives are the African great apes and the early stages of human evolution all took place in Africa. Uh, these are four different fossil skulls of organisms that are related to us. They've all been found in Africa, uh, the one at the upper left in South Africa, uh, the others in East Africa, uh, in Kenya or Ethiopia, if memory serves. That's not really in serious debate anymore. Uh, if you go back far enough in your family tree, you did have ancestors that walked kind of stooped and had small brains and big brow ridges and probably really liked bananas and said, ook, ook, eek. That's actually not a bad description of one of my aunts, but let's not get into that. And we continue to refine our picture of the past because every so often we find more. Um, these are some of the remains of a species of human relative that was named Homo naledi, uh, found in Southern Africa. Uh, the discovery was announced in 2015. Uh, you can see we've got a not perfectly complete, but pretty complete uh, skeleton uh, shown at the right. Uh, that's parts of the skull seen in side view over on the left. Uh, not much of a face, but we've got both of the jaws. And this is not all that was found. Uh, it was one cave that had the remains of no fewer than 15 individuals of this new species. And in 2018, we finally got out a complete skeleton of a human relative from South Africa uh, called Littlefoot. Um, Littlefoot was actually found in 1997, but getting the, uh, the bones were buried in this very hard limestone and getting the bones out without destroying them uh, took 20 years of extremely delicate excavation. Uh, so this is what Littlefoot looks like. And you can see that's a pretty complete skeleton. So we keep finding new human relatives in the fossil record and trying to figure out where they fit into our own species story. Um, every year, somebody finds something that adds new information uh, to human evolution. Here's what we don't do. Kind of the mental image that a lot of people have of human evolution is something like this march of progress. Uh, these were actually created for Time Life books back in the 60s. And over there on the left, you know, we start with Bonzo the chimp, who is the most stooped with the smallest brain. And then a couple of steps to the right, uh, we've got Oog the ape man with the uh, slightly more raised posture and slightly bigger brain. And then a couple of steps to the right, we've got Gorgo, the Australopithecus, with an even more erect posture and slightly bigger brain. 
and everybody's kind of marching forward uh, all the way to the end where we've got Fred, the naked white guy. And it's just kind of funny that these diagrams always seem to end with a white man leading the march of progress. Uh, there's probably a lesson to be taken from that, but I'll let you think that out for yourself. Here's the thing. The really thing that's wrong with diagrams like this is not that it's led by a white dude. It's not that they've all been drawn in such a way that you can't see their junk. It's the fact that evolution does not make single line marches of progress like that. These species that you're seeing all did exist. We've got fossils of all of them, but they didn't just appear and progressively replace each other like the iPhone 7 replacing the iPhone 6. That's not how this works. A much more accurate idea of how human evolution has worked is given by this tree-like diagram. Um, the earliest fossil evidence uh, that we can find uh, goes all the way back about 35 million years. And then the earliest uh, fossil organisms that we know are probably close to the ancestors of another group. And then that group splits into a couple of others. And then that group divides. And then that group divides. And then that group splits and splits. And what you can see I'm drawing is another one of these tree diagrams. That's the way evolution has worked for us, just as it does for every other species on the planet. And the result is the vast majority of fossils of hominids, that's primates that are most closely related to ourselves, we're up here, by the way, are not our direct ancestors. And that's exactly what we'd expect. I wish I'd thought to bring it, but I've got a photo album that used to belong to my great grandmother. And it's got lots of photos of relatives of a hundred years ago or even farther back. Uh, there's even one of a guy in a Civil War uniform. That's how far back this goes. Unfortunately, my great grandmother never thought to label the photos. So I don't know who the people are. This is very annoying, but they were related to me in some way. Most of them cannot be my direct ancestors. You know, if you think about it, you know, you've only got, let's say if you think about your father's ancestry, you've only got one father. You might have many uncles and many great uncles and lots of cousins and lots of second cousins that are all related to you because they share a common ancestor with you. They share the same grandfather or great grandfather or something like that. Uh, the last family reunion I went to, there were only a couple of people there that were my direct ancestors. There was my dad and my grandmother but there were lots of people who were related to me on separate branches of the family. Um, my dad's sister had five kids and they've all got kids. So I had a lot of cousins that are descended uh, that are related to me that way. Um, my dad's mother's mother had kids and they had kids and they had kids. And so I've got a lot of distant cousins that are descended that way. The majority of the people at that family reunion were not my direct ancestors, but they're related to me somehow. And they're related through this branching process. And it's the same thing with extinct species of human relative or of anything else. And we express how they're related to each other through these tree-shaped diagrams. And an upshot is that humans did not evolve from apes. We still are apes. And we're also mammals. And we're also vertebrates, organisms that have a backbone. 
And we're also in the animal kingdom. And we're also eukaryotes. All of these are true at the same time. Just like, you know, you are in Conway and you're also in Arkansas and you're also in the United States and you're also in North America right now, right? Because North America contains the United States and the United States contains Arkansas and Arkansas contains Conway and Conway contains UCA and UCA contains, I don't know, the library or wherever it is that you are right now, right? We have these large groupings that contain smaller entities within them. And the tree of life works the same way. Each one of these groupings is a smaller branch that's included in a larger and more inclusive branch. So that's what I mean when I say that humans didn't evolve from apes, we still are. Highly specialized, very intelligent, really cool apes, but we're still in that group. Just like we are still vertebrates because we've still got backbones. And we're still eukaryotes because our cells still have nuclei. I wanna finish with a couple more misconceptions. I already talked about how evolution is not one species just replacing another in some sort of march of progress, like iPhone models. Evolution is also not necessarily some kind of advances in complexity. Um, on the right, those are photosynthetic bacteria. Uh, they happen to have a blue-green color. Uh, there were actually some in the pond water uh, that we looked at uh, last week in lab. Under the right conditions, you can actually get microscopic fossils of bacteria. Um, sounds weird, but you can in certain rocks um, if you take those rocks and you slice them extremely thinly. And you know, I know people that have, have done this. And they've shown that blue-green bacteria have been around on this planet for at least half of its history, at least two billion years, and they haven't changed in any really measurable way. Uh, those are fossils over there on the left, and everything that we can still see under the light microscope is practically identical to bacteria that you could find now in pond water. And I've met people that have tried to use this to argue against evolution, but it isn't really, because there is no requirement that evolution has to make everything more complex. Blue-green bacteria evidently evolved a particular lifestyle two billion years ago. It worked for them, and that's what they're still doing. Darwinian evolution, you could call survival of whatever works well enough and sometimes very, very ancient designs in ancient lifestyles still work, why change them? No, re no sense in fixing what's broken. Evolution can't, sorry, evolution doesn't fix what ain't broken. I hate the phrase survival of the fittest because everybody thinks it means survival of the meanest, survival of the most savage. Survival of the lion slaughtering a helpless gazelle on the Serengeti plain or whatever they've got this week on Animal Planet. We do use the word fitness and it's got a technical meaning in the mathematics that we use to model evolution. You can take biology 4415 if you ever want to learn that. But fitness does not mean meanness. Fitness is not meanness or cruelty. And evolution is not about survival of the most savage. Very, 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 very often, and you'll see examples of this later on, we're going to be coming back to this, the organisms that are likeliest to survive, reproduce, and pass on their traits are not the most savage. They're often the most cooperative. And we will look at some spectacular examples of this uh, coming 
up towards the end of the course. Uh, nothing about biological evolution says, you know, go out and be really, really mean. You know, go out and and kill and slaughter. Well, there might be times where that is the best, uh, where where that's the best option. There's many times where it's not. Nothing in evolution is any kind of moral imperative. Uh, to go out and be cruel and, you know, walk on corpses to get what you want. You know, you shouldn't really be taking moral lessons from it at all. Finally, the whole evolution versus religion thing. Uh, this tends to be a live issue for some people, including, believe it or not, some people in Arkansas. Possibly for some of you. That's none of my business. You know, I think it's always interesting to discuss religious ideas. I've got some of my own, you have yours, and that's all well and good. But ultimately, I'm not paid here to make you change any sort of faith that you've got. If you follow a religious tradition, that makes you a better human being than you otherwise would have been and encourages you not to go around hurting people unnecessarily, no quarrels with that there. You know, it is not my place to tell you that you're wrong. You know, that's not what the state pays me for. I will say that there's a long tradition of what's called theistic evolution. Theism is the position that there is a God or gods and they are active in the world. And theistic evolution interprets evolution as being the way in which God accomplishes whatever God's purposes might be. When I started asking questions about this when I was about seven, this is what my mama told me. Now that I'm 52, it's not my place to say whether this is right or wrong. That's ultimately up to you. That's, you know, your, your path to walk. You know, that's your spiritual meat to chew on. But many Christian denominations have no difficulty with biological evolution at all. They don't interpret the creation story in the book of Genesis as a play-by-play -play literal record of what exactly happened. Uh, they find it spiritually very significant as you know, part of their religion, but it doesn't have to have happened. You know, it doesn't have to be factual in order to contain truth. Uh, certainly the Roman Catholic Church has no difficulty with biological evolution, neither do most mainline Protestant denominations. The subject is a lot more interesting than black and white, either atheist evolution or religious creationism. There's a lot more space in between to explore. I'll leave the last words to Charles Darwin, whose opinion was that one who wishes to form a judgment on the subject must weigh the evidence for himself, and he ought not to be influenced by being told that a considerable number of scientific men can reconcile the results of science with revealed or natural religion, whilst others cannot do so. Work it out for yourself. The safest conclusion seems to be that the whole subject is beyond the scope of man's intellect, but man can do his duty. And on that note, I will stop the recording.